so yeah, that's that's supposed to be me. As you can see, I'm a little bit larger in real life. So some of you know me as a blogger. Some of you know me as a programmer and a researcher. Others know me as a writer. And I want to share with you some insights that I've picked up as I bounced around these different careers. I want to talk to you about how we connect. I want to talk to you about how Game of Thrones became popular and how tech startup people might kind of be similar to racists in their behavior. So there's a lot of stuff, so let's begin. So my story starts 10 years ago. I was actually quite poor and I was living in a slum. Uh, there was, you know, basically just a concrete hut and uh, yeah, there we are. So that was, you know, basically me, concrete hut, metal roof, nothing special. Uh, we were at the low end of the socioeconomic ladder and uh, my neighborhood were people who were like me, typically Sinhala Buddhist, not very educated. Most of them were school dropouts. In fact, I myself dropped out of school. We would, most of them would go on to drive three wheelers for a living. So we had certain beliefs. We believed that education was useless, that English was for some sort of posh people, that Muslims had a thousand children and all Tamils were LTT supporters. Now you can see that these are rather problematic beliefs to have. Now I knew that there were other communities that did not share these beliefs. My father was a driver and he would come back and he would tell me about the people that he drove for. People who lived in Colombo apartments and drank whiskey and talked about the American economy. It was fascinating because these people to me were like aliens. So I had two options. I could either choose to believe in what people like me believed well, I could choose to believe the aliens. And actually, I believed in people like me. Yeah, so that's me, slowly picking up their beliefs. And one day, I started a blog. I don't know why I did it, and I like to write, so I kept on writing. And the early blogosphere, way back in the day, was this very diverse place. There were all sorts of different people there, all sorts of different communities, but very small. So every time I put something out, these people would argue ferociously. I would come and say, here's how the world works, and they say, no, 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 absolutely not, you're completely wrong. And I would save up 50 rupees a week. I'd go to this internet cafe and I'd read their stuff and argue back and forth all the time. But out of these arguments, I learned something. This, suddenly there was all sorts of conflicting information coming my way. Suddenly there was this belief that what my community believed was not necessarily right or true. So my biases slowly began to be stripped away from me. Those beliefs that I had every time someone in the slum made a racist joke, I had this contradicting information in my head and I could look at that and say, no, I refuse to participate in this. I'd like to say that blog actually made me a better person. But sadly, good things don't last. As more and more people came online, the bloggers started sorting themselves out into different little groups. The rich urban educated people sorted themselves out into one, the Marxists went to another, and we stopped talking to each other. I was not immune. I had, by that time, gained quite an audience. There were about 200,000 people reading what I said. And I had my own little clique, my own little micro-community around me. We all had the same political beliefs, the same ideologies, same way of thinking. And I, there came a day when I realized that all the people who disagreed with me, the people that I learned from, they were gone. And this was very sad because I had no one to learn from anymore. So as an author and a researcher, today I can put names to these effects. The first is similarity. In academia, it's called homophily. This is the concept that people tend to make friends faster, easier, and connect more often to people who are like us. We, we like people who are like us, basically. And we look for certain types of similarity. We look for race and ethnicity, age, shared values, education. We look for people who are roughly on the same places on the socioeconomic ladder. We do these things almost subconsciously. And we might all think that, no, I don't make friends that way, but really, large groups of people follow these laws. Case in point, 
We looked at the call data for 10 million people in Sri Lanka. We looked at where they call from, where they call to. And what we found was that those stereotypes, you know what they say about the rich upper class people in Colombo who know nothing about the rest of the country? That's us in red right there. You know the stereotypes about the people in Kandy, the Udarata, Kattir, and how the people down south are two completely different communities altogether? Yeah, these are similar people connecting to other similar people. In fact, it's not just Sri Lanka. Entire nations follow these laws. So as you can see, this is uh, a piece of research that we did where we looked at Facebook. It's a network of 2.3 billion people. We looked at friend connections. and We looked at how they form between nations. And we realized that nations tend to cluster themselves into communities like this. You have the Americas hanging out over there, the sort of Islamic countries form their own little community there. All of Europe sort of buckets itself there, the African countries hang out. So these are, again, similar people hanging out with other similar people. And they form communities, and I would argue that that's a good thing, because we need communities. One person can't build a pyramid, you need 2,000 for that. But what happens when we form these communities? We stop talking to each other, and then something pretty bad kicks in. We call it groupthink. See, groupthink is the tendency for people to absorb whatever beliefs that circulate in the community around them. Even if sometimes they don't make sense, we pick these up. Now, for example, me in my slum, picking up beliefs which are obviously not rational. But I'll give you an example which I think you can relate to, Game of Thrones. Right? All your friends are talking about Game of Thrones, everybody's talking about it, suddenly you start watching it because you don't want to be left out. Or the cricket match. Every time World Cup comes around, people start talking about this thing and suddenly you're watching it just to stay in touch because you really don't want to be left out of those conversations. This is a very subconscious thing. And I, you know, TV series, cricket matches, maybe not so bad. But what about ideas? An idea like, maybe you should vote for a particular politician. An idea like, Maybe this particular race of people are bad and should be removed from this country. Does that sound familiar to you? You see, groupthink gives us unquestioned belief. It makes us censor the ideas that we generate, which don't actually conform to the group norms. It makes us stereotype anyone who opposes us. It makes us close-minded. So if you were in medieval England, you'd be strapping on a sword to join the crusade. Instead, today, you're eating avocado toast, which is the great enemy of mankind. You're watching Game of Thrones, you're investing in startups that you shouldn't, and you're watching your friends join some cult church, wondering if you're the odd man out. And in fact, I'll give you an example. As a journalist, I came across two groups that conform so perfectly to this, the tech startup people and the singular Buddhist racist. Day in and day out, they would generate ideas that made absolutely no sense. I know some of you have seen this. And you tell them maybe your business plan doesn't work, or what you're saying is morally and ethically ambiguous, and they just, one person would quote Steve Jobs, the other might quote the Togamanu, and they'd go back to their own little circles. Right? We've all seen this happen. But this became a problem to me, because I was quite frightened. I saw so many good and rational people, well-educated people, falling into these traps and becoming right-wing racists, and it, I was there, I don't want to go back there. So I looked for answers. And I found a man called John Stuart Mill, who once said, and I quote, it is hardly possible to overstate the value of placing people in connection with people who are dissimilar to themselves. Such is one of the primary causes of progress, dissimilarity. That became a very interesting idea. So I decided to conduct an experiment on myself. Two years ago, I ditched all of my best friends. If some of you are in the audience today, I'm sorry. I um, kept only people who were not similar to me. I kept an antisocial programmer. I kept an anarchist metalhead, a businessman, a guy who runs nightclubs, an activist. People who would never get along in the same room. If you put them in the same room, they beat each other to death. So no similarity was my theory. No similarity, no community forms, thus no groupthink. Even this wasn't enough. Because at the end of the day, these are all people from Sri Lanka. So if you put the national anthem, they'll all stand up. So I reached out through Facebook to 
researchers in India and activists in all sorts of countries and right-wing science fiction authors from America. And I put myself at the heart of this sort of crossroads of different people, different beliefs, and something amazing happened. My group think, my beliefs began to be dissected. There was nothing I could say without someone arguing back, and it felt like being a blogger again. And I had arguments, yes. My friends will tell you that I do argue a lot with a lot of people. But through these arguments, I started learning. And I could push aside my biases, and I could absorb information again. And thus, I started learning and started evolving again. Now, today, people introduce me, if you've read that TEDx docket, as an author and a researcher. I don't think I've done any of these things by being particularly smart or good-looking. My secret, if I actually have one, is that I tend to reach out to people who are dissimilar with me, who, who, don't actually, who I don't get along with, and then I learn from them. I evolve, and this, as an author, my greatest strength is that when I put something out, a dozen people who are completely unlike each other have seen it, they've critiqued it. If it can get through them, it can get through the rest of the world. As a researcher, the same thing applies. This practice is codified in our place of work. So, what I want to ask you to do is to stop a minute, think about the similarity in your friend circles, in your communities. Think about what biases and beliefs you may have accepted subconsciously, just because people similar to you are saying these things. Now, we know the causes, we know the effects, we know it's not good for us. And what I'd like you to do is start connecting to people who are not like you, to people who violate these fault lines. Because as John Stuart Mill said, it is one of the primary sources of progress. And I would say in today's political climate, we need this now more than ever before. Consider that had I been in the slum, had I absorbed that had I obeyed that similarity and that group think, I would still be a racist. I would not be giving a speech in English in front of 1,200 people. I wouldn't be writing books, I wouldn't be doing any of this stuff. But this is, to me, one of the most important things you can do. I'm not asking you to be as extreme as I did. I'm not asking you to remove your friends overnight, that's difficult. But we live in a world of social media where potentially billions of people can connect to each other with a click of a button. I'm asking you to go home. Think about the group, think in your own circles. Start connecting outside. Fight similarity. I know I did, and here we are. Thank you for listening to me.